We believe that you are strong by design and you were made in God's image to have a strong body, mind, and spirit. You're listening to the number one strength and health authority podcast in the world. So let's get ready to unlock your potential and transform your life in today's episode. Hi, and welcome to the Strong by Design podcast. I am your host today, Tanya Fines, and joined by a very special guest, Dr. Livingston. Welcome to Strong by Design, Dr. Livingston. Thank you for having me. Please call me Glenn. Oh, well, thank thank you, Glenn. Thank you for joining me today. Um, just a little bit that I want to tell you about Glenn before I let him, uh, you, you know, you're tuning in to listen to him and not me, but Dr. Uh, Glenn Livingston, he's a PhD, a veteran psychologist, and actually was for a long time CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm that served several Fortune 500, uh, com- 500 clients in the food industry. So you've been in food for a long, long time. Yeah, I, <laughs> food, food and pharmaceuticals and things yes, like that. I, I don't do that anymore. I was on the wrong side of the war. But, right. Um, okay. Yeah. Which, we're, which we're definitely going to get to. And... Um, Basically, disillusion in, in your traditional psychology practice and what had to overweight people, like for especially people that were struggling with, with weight and, and food issues. Um, you spent several decades researching the nature of binge eating and overeating while working with your own patients, but it was actually your own journey. Um, coming, you know, being overweight and working through that, that had the biggest impact on your practice. And you're also the author of, you can check this out on Amazon, folks, it's called Never Binge Again, How to Stop Overeating and Binge Eating, as well as Stick to the Food Plan of Your Choice. So again, welcome, Glenn. Welcome to the show. It's great to be here. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, well, I can't wait too um, because we're gonna we're gonna actually focus on we're gonna have a conversation about binge eating because I think this is, I mean, binge eating to me is a huge it's it's like it's epidemic in a way in terms of proportions and the number of people that it affects and yet it's just it's like we haven't quite. I don't want to say a cure because I think we're dealing largely with a, a psychological issue when it comes to binge eating and food and overeating because like everything in our life, we have relationships with everything and food isn't exclusive exclusive of that. We have a relationship with food and when that is unhealthy, you know, our, the way we interact with food, how much we eat, how little of, little of it that we eat becomes a huge issue. So let's talk about binge eating because you wrote a book to, you know, help guide us through how, you know, how to stop it. But let's talk about, you know, what that is. What, what are some of the reasons why we do it? Because I think a lot of times a person in the middle of a binge, they know it, they're in it, they're doing it. And they're like, I don't want to be doing this. This doesn't feel good. This isn't right. Yeah. Well, that's a very deep question and we can go all kinds of directions with that. But um, let me say that I think it's a miracle in today's day and age that there aren't more people diagnosed with binge eating. I think it's a miracle that anybody can actually eat healthy. When when you look at all the hyper palatable foods that the big food companies are designing, the concentrations of starch and sugar and excitotoxins and fat and salt and um, and it's all it's all targeted at targeted at the reptilian brain. Um, you can kind of think of the brain in two parts. There's a reptilian brain, and that that part of the brain says. When it looks at something in the environment, do I eat it? Do I mate with it or do I kill it? There's no love there. It's very important that you recognize there's no love there. It's eat, mate, or kill. It's really then the mammalian brain and the neocortex that says, wait, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact will that have on the people that I love, on my tribe? What impact that will, will that have on my longer term goals and dreams and weight loss aspirations or fitness aspirations, but what impact will that have on the kind of person that I want to be or that I'm trying to become? So we're really of two brains. That begins to answer why we can read a diet book over the weekend and have a therapy session and feel all motivated to be mindful and good on this new diet we're planning. And then at you know three o'clock in the afternoon, you're at Starbucks and there's a big hairy chocolate bar at the counter that has your name on it and says, you know, G. Glenn chocolate is, uh, it really comes from a cocoa bean and that grows on a plant and therefore it's a vegetable. And and it seems reasonable at the time. Yes, it does. It very much so. (laughs) Yeah, maybe not exactly that. Maybe it's more like um, you worked out hard enough. Why can't you start tomorrow? You're not going to get it. Why can't you start tomorrow, right? Um, 
So what is binge eating? You, you could look up in the DSM-5 online the criteria for binge eating, and it has to do with um, the frequency with which you eat large quantities, quantities of food and feel disgusted with it, basically, um, and wind up in this self-castigating negative cycle where you're you hear this voice in your head that's telling you that you're pathetic and you you know you can't stop and it just it just feels awful but there are a bunch of other criteria um and includes very specifically a feeling of being out of control and i that's all true that's a very clear diagnostic entity but i you know i read for psychology today as well and i wrote this article uh, a few months ago when i realized that over 40 percent of americans are obese over 40 percent that's staggering really and and the it really is and, and the the um the rates of diabetes and heart disease and cancer are staggeringly up yet only 2.6 percent of the population is diagnosed with binge eating disorder so there's there's a real disconnect and i don't think the question you should be asking yourself is am i a binge eater or not because that's that's almost like asking, am I bad enough to do anything about this? It's almost like saying, how long can I get away with what I'm doing before I have to do something about it? I think the question we should be asking is, am I able to follow my own best judgment with food? Am I able to follow a plan to achieve the level of health and fitness that I want? Um, or do I, with any frequency, seem to overshoot those goals, throw, throw my plans out the window? Am I not achieving the body and mind and state of being that I really want to achieve? I, I think that's a better question. And the reason I think it's important is because I, I think that I spent a lot of years saying, personally, I spent a lot of years saying I'm not really a binge eater. Um, I spent a lot of years um, saying it really wasn't that bad because I'm, you know, I'm 6'4". I'm modestly muscular without really doing much about it. I, I don't mm -hmm. mean to brag, but it's just how, <laughs> yeah. it's ge genetically how it worked out. And so I could eat an awful lot when I was young without people saying I was fat. Um, and I discovered that if I worked out for two or three hours, I could actually eat uh, six or 7,000 calories a day, anything, anything that wasn't nailed down. It, and it, it didn't seem like a problem. It was more of a like a superpower. Um, but when I got older, it kind of had a life of its own. And, um, <laughs> it does that, doesn't it? It, it does that. And it, it was interfering, that, yeah. interfering with me as a psych psychologist and all that. So, um, so the question I'd like us to ask ourselves is, um, what, what can I do to get more control than I have and eat in line with my own best judgment? And what's preventing that are three things. What, one is the, the food industry, which is, it's really targeting the bliss point in the reptilian brain without giving us enough nutrition to feel satisfied. And that results in a kind of warping of the survival drive and an interest in, you know, looking for love in these bags and boxes and containers instead of what nature really has to offer. The other thing that's causing the problem is that people believe, as I did for 20 or 30 years in my own struggle, pe people believe that the problem is that we don't love ourselves enough. And so, you know, I come, up from, I come from a family of 17 psychotherapists and psychologists, and the standard joke is that if something breaks in the household, we all know how to ask how, how it feels and nobody knows how to but so my first approach was, gee, I have this problem because I probably don't love myself enough. I've, I must have a hole in my heart. And if I could fill the hole in my heart and love myself more, then I wouldn't have to keep trying to fill the hole in my stomach. And, you know, I, I worked myself up to about 280 pounds trying to do that. And I, I took a really long, soulful journey. And I went to see psychologists and psychiatrists and some of the best people around. And I went to Overeaters Anonymous. But I found that... I would learn a lot about myself and I would feel better about myself, but it really wasn't working to help me with the binge eating. I'd get thinner and a little thinner, a lot fatter, a little thinner, a lot fatter. Um, and when I, when I discovered that the brain was set up with this kind of, you know, two different pieces and that the piece that was responsible for food addiction was the more primitive brain, like the seed of the survival responses, the 
feast and famine response to you know freeze or flight response um, I recognize that that part of the brain didn't know love so it was kind of silly that I was trying to love myself then for all these years when there was this very primitive part of the brain that was taking over and that um, controlling this might be might be more like an alpha wolf dealing with a challenger for leadership because if, if you think about the way we tr control other biological impulses if if I really had to pee right now then I would tell my bladder look I understand you have to pee but I'm talking to Tanya and we're gonna have a we're gonna have a nice talk for about 45 minutes or so and then I'll take care of you later <laughs> I, I, I would assert control I would be superior yeah. right and if you think about the way or, or, or if you're if there's an attractive woman on the street, I don't just like run up to her and kiss her. Um, you know, there are ways to approach people and I'm, I'm actually kind of shy in those situations, so I don't <laughs> that tend to do that anyway. Um, and, but so we, we take control in the natural course of being civilized human beings. And why is this really any different? Um, it's, it's different because we're told it's, it's different. We're told that we don't love ourselves enough and that's the reason we're having trouble. It's different because the big food industry has a very high profit incentive to um, drive us out of control. It's bit different because the big advertising industry uh, is very adept at convincing us that we need these things to survive. They, I, I remember, uh, I'm going a little bit all over the place, you can draw me in if you want to, but I, I remember working with the VP of a major food bar manufacturer and I asked him what the most profitable insight was in the company and he said, well, it was when we took the vitamins out of the bar because they were expensive and making it taste bad. And we put it into the packaging instead. We made the packaging oh. look like multicolored and vibrant. Right, and, very attractive. Which in nature, uh, diversity of colors and vibrancy signals a diversity of nutrients available. So it's a, a signal to the primitive brain that says you need this. Right. Um, hmm. so, so you're faking us out. <laughs> yeah, very right? interesting. Very interesting. Wow. So, so I think there's a perfect storm in our society that mm. prevents us from um, really seeing what the truth is. I, th I think that it overstimulates our pleasure systems and makes us a little bit numb uh, to the natural tastes and you know natural sugars available in fruit and vegetables and you know whole foods and um, you know, and I think that people are being told something that's not really true, which is that you need to love yourself more in order to, to get better. Um, right. It is a loving thing to do to right. get better, but that doesn't mean you have to solve all your psychological problems before you can stop overeating. Our team would like to thank you so much for listening to the Strong by Design podcast. And if you're enjoying today's show, please share this episode with at least one friend or family member who will benefit from this message. And please subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Go to strongbydesignpodcast.com. That's strongbydesignpodcast.com. Let's get back to the show. So I was going to ask you, because I'm, I'm like hearing what you're saying and the parts like, you know, the, the, the reptilian brain, how, you know, how the brain is, and there's all of that that's happening. And yes, definitely. Um, I think people have an awareness when they're binging or that they have an issue with food. They might not really fully embrace it or be like, Oh, well, I've got this problem. I need to fix it, but they know it's there. So it's kind of weighing on them, but I'm um, see how, if I, I know what I'm, what I'm thinking, but I'm going to try to say it without butchering it. This is the ADD kicking in my head. It's just going in all these different places, but we have, um, like what I've often seen in my own practice is that, you know, people want to lose weight, you know, they want to lose weight. And it always, I worked a little differently working more with a psychological approach because you can take somebody and create the perfect eating plan, the perfect exercise plan that they might even really enjoy. Like they might actually really love, you know, going for walks or riding their bike or working out. But what what do you have to say to the fact that what about this emotional connection, the psychological connection that the best program as far as like, okay, yes, realistically, losing weight is going to help you feel better. 
It's going to help you look better. But if we don't actually get to the root of why you're binging, like what I, I mean, there, you, you bring up some really other good factors that I, you know, that like I'm right, right now, my head's going, wow, you know, there's all there's this whole other like so this perfect storm. So we've got this perfect storm of, you know, the food industry, what's in our food, you know, food addiction, how the brain works, what's going on there from a very primitive level. And yet there's also this human side to me, there's this human psychology side that if we're also not dealing with some issues, like even like bigger than self-love but just stuff triggers how do we get all of this in line to work (laughs) like it seems to me like a big bit like there's there's so much happening and going on well um i've got a lot to say about that and it's definitely true that when you overload the digestive system the nervous system has trouble conducting the emotions and so what that means is that excess food has an anesthetic effect on um, on your emotions. It makes it harder to feel. And so there's some truth to the idea that people are escaping their emotional conflict by, uh, by binging or overeating. They're, they're quote unquote numbing themselves out. But I think that's an oversimplification of the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, Maybe I should tell a story about tell this. Tell a story. We love stories. Okay. People, yeah, stories relate. So, so everybody listening wants to know how they can better get control and stop binging. We all want to know how to do it. Okay. <laughs> so, so I, uh, I was struggling with chocolate. That was always my first go-to item when I would have a binge. Mm. And I wound up doing this forty thousand person study over many years back in like nineteen nine. 2000 when internet clicks were cheap and I intercepted people when they were feeling stressed and I asked them what foods they couldn't stop eating when they felt stressed and I saw some interesting correlations for people who people who couldn't stop eating chocolate they tended to be lonely brokenhearted or depressed more so than other people people that couldn't stop eating uh, salty crunching things tended to be very stressed at work and people who couldn't stop eating soft, chewy, starchy things like bread and bagels and pizza, they tended to be stressed at home. And I thought that was fascinating. And I thought, well, before I go talk about this, I just want to figure it out for myself. So I called my mother who raised me and is also a psychotherapist. And I said, Mom, you know, I'm not in a great marriage and I'm, I am a little lonely and brokenhearted. But how did this pattern of running into chocolate when I feel, you know, depressed or lonely, how did that get set up? And she gets this horrible look on her face and she says, I'm so sorry, Glenn. Oh. I, I, <laughs> and I said, Mom, it's okay. It was, this was 15 years ago now, but yeah. it, it was, she says, I said, Mom, it was 40 years ago. I'm just talking about, I just want to know. It's okay. I love you. I forgive you. I want to know. And so she said, I'm so sorry, but when you were one year old in 1965, your father was a, my husband was a captain in the army. And they were talking about sending him to D- Vietnam and I was terrified. We had another child on the way. I thought I was going to be a, you know, a mother of two young kids. I'm going to be an army widow. I was terrified. At the same time, your grandfather, my father, was a, um, he was a criminal and I didn't know. And he had just been sent to jail and he was guilty. I just didn't know. And I had always idolized him. And my whole life came apart because I, um, I just didn't know. And so he says, Glenn, honey, I'm sorry, but when you would come running to me for love or even for some healthy food, I didn't always have it in me to give it to you. So I kept a big bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup on the floor and and I would say, go get your Bosco. And you'd go crawling over to the refrigerator and you'd, you'd take the Bosco out and you'd open the cap and you'd suck on the bottle and you'd go into a chocolate sugar coma. (laughs) And and that's how it all started. That's how it started. Hmm. And so that's definitely the match that struck the fire. Mm-hmm. And it was a good conversation to have. I mean, if, if this were a movie, we would have had a good cry and a good hug. And I would never have trouble with chocolate again. But it was a good conversation to have. I certainly forgave her. I forgave myself. I, I did not hate myself as much as I used to. And I, so it was a really good thing to do. But my binging on chocolate got worse after that. And the reason it got worse was that there was this voice of justification in my head. And it went something like this. You know what, Glenn? You're right. 
our mama didn't love us enough and she left a great big chocolate sized hole in your heart. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and, and, and until you can yeah. until you can find the love of your life and get out of this marriage, you're just gonna have to go right on binging on chocolate. Let's go get more right now, yippee. And at that point I put a lot of things together. I was thinking about, you know, the food industry that was an outside source that had nothing to do with whether my mama loved me enough or I was in a bad marriage. I was thinking about the advertising industry. I was thinking about the addiction treatment industry. And, and I said, these are all, this has nothing to do with my personal psychology. Um, and then I recognized that the relationship was a little more complicated than I thought it was. So if you think of the emotions as the, as the fire, you could have a roaring fire in a well-contained fireplace in the living room. And that's an asset, not a liability. Uh, people gather around, they make memories, they hug and they cry and they tell stories and they laugh. It's only if there are holes in the fireplace that the fire can escape and burn the house down. And I realized that maybe it was more like this voice of justification was poking holes in the fireplace and, and letting the emotional conflicts that I had, um, letting them turn into these binge eating patterns. And, and so what I did is I worked with ways to separate my, you know, my upper brain from my lower brain. I, I would work with ways to calm down at the moment of impulse. I would, I mean, what I actually did, I was not going to publish this. This was going to be a private thing. I actually called it, um, you call it Urena Food Demon. I called it my inner pig at the time. I wish I called it something different. Um, but I called it my inner pig and I would draw a very bright line that would say, I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. I'll only, only ever have chocolate on Saturdays. And if I heard that voice in my head that said, you worked out hard enough, you can just start tomorrow, even though it's a Wednesday, I'd say, wait a minute, that's not me, that's my inner pig. My pig is squealing for slop. I don't eat pig slop, I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. It wasn't really a big psychological insight. It was more like a, a way to separate from that reptilian brain and wake up when it was getting active. And I wish I could tell you that that was a miracle. Um, it, it cut through the confusion and I was able to make the right choice, you know, sometimes at that point, as opposed to feeling powerless and like there was some mysterious force inside of me. Um, but, but so going back to the point about emotions, so I recognize that it's not just that we have an emotion and we run to food. We have an emotion, then there's this voice of justification and we run to food. So you could actually disempower that voice of justification. So if you can wake up at the moment and, and hear that voice that says you could just start tomorrow because you worked out hard enough, it's just as easy. I can say, wait a minute, that's not true. The principles of neurology say that if you have a craving today and you um, and, and you accept and indulge it today, that craving is going to be stronger tomorrow because what fires together wires together. That's the principle of neuroplasticity. And, and, and so I would say, well, that's not really true. That's incorrect. If I'm, it's going to make things worse. If I'm in a hole, what I have to do is stop digging. And so I found I could take that voice of justification away. And then what was left was the emotion um, and the action. And Without the voice of justification, it wasn't such a greased shoot. It wasn't so mm. quick to go from emotion to action. Okay. Then I could look more at the emotion and say, well, maybe I am feeling lonely and brokenhearted. Maybe I could go, you know, call somebody or, mm -hmm. you know, hug a friend or something like that. Right. Um, but I also would say that it's okay to be lonely. It was okay sometimes to be lonely. Okay. Yeah, I think because I think sometimes, um, I mean, life happens. Life's happening all the time. There's nothing linear about it. It's a very dynamic process from minute to minute. So I don't know. I mean, um, I know there are people, there's professionals, there's therapists that will just say, you know, it's okay to, to feel like that. Like sometimes you just have to be sad or sometimes you just got to feel that. But a lot of times, like maybe not so much in the, within the profession, but within our families and friends, because, you know, we want, it, we want the people we love to feel good. So when they're feeling sad, we really can oftentimes go out of our way to do everything to try to make them feel better, um, try to bring in better emotions. But sometimes what has to happen is just feeling them feeling what's happening. And, and not be so frightened of it. And yeah, and like just, it is, I'm just, I'm just not feeling happy right now. I'm just, you know, and let it kind of bubble up and whatever happens with, you know, like just being in that moment. You know, I, I don't know that it's realistic or even healthy to always have like have this 
idea or this mindset that we always have to be in our happy place. Right. And we can't always be in a happy place. <laughs> Especially not in the world that we live in today. Well, yeah. no, it's just, and it's not, I mean, really, I mean, as, 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 as not good as that feels, I mean, learning doesn't only always come from feeling good. Learning comes from when we're not feeling good. Right. How, do, how do, you know, first of all, be aware of this is how I'm feeling. I mean, I'm in the middle of a, a, a beautiful place, a beautiful house, all the beautiful kids. But I just I'm not happy. I'm not happy right now. And there's tremendous awareness in acknowledging that. And then there's like probably a lot of growth that needs to happen or something because it doesn't always like when things are good, they're good. And when they're not is when things get addressed and dealt with, hopefully. If, if we're not always trying to jump out of it or get people to pull us out of it. We, we spend yeah. a lot of time being frightened of our feelings, too. Right. And they're often not quite as bad as we think they're going to be. It's often the fear and the things that we do to cover over that fear that make our lives worse. A lot yeah. of times if you can sit with the feelings for often as little as 90 seconds, but mm -hmm. you know, sometimes for an hour or two, right. you can do a lot better. Right. Um, so but I want to say a little bit more about the relationship between emotion and over Yeah. Yeah, okay. please. Yeah. So it is the case, for example, in my case, that feeling lonely or depressed or let's say I had a bad interaction with my wife at the time um, would make me unhappy and then make me want to binge. It's true that that was, tr that, that was the case. And it's true that there was this voice of justification that greased the chute and I could slow it down like that. What I didn't know was also true was that things work in the other direction. So... If you, let's take anxiety, it's a better, it's easier to illustrate with. A lot of people will tell me that they feel very anxious and they can't go to sleep without binging. And what they don't, so, so it's true that the excess food will quell that anxiety for a little while. But what's also true is that if you have that anxiety and then you have the excess food, you're teaching your body to produce more anxiety because you're rewarding by the principles of operant conditioning, you're rewarding. And there are, like there are studies with animals and we look at the physiological correlates of anxiety like um, heightened heart rate and perspiration and, um, you know, and breathing and elevated, elevated blood pressure. You can even look at galvanic skin response. When you can condition animals to have high blood pressure by giving them a sugar reward every time their blood pressure is elevated. And, and so what we don't realize is that you feel unhappy and then you go to chocolate, you've actually reinforced your body for feeling unhappy and it's more likely to produce those unhappy feelings in the future. So it goes both ways. Um, the last thing that the idea of numbing out with food misses is that um, we're not really going to things that make us numb. We're going to things that give us an artificial high. So Chocolate is a concentration of sugar and theobramine and caffeine and substances that are not really meant to be presented to the body. I'm not saying it's an evil thing. I think chocolate's a lovely thing for a lot of people. Yes, that's so do I. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. I agree, um, totally. <laughs> but, but that's different than saying that it's healthy, you know? It's different right. than saying that it's healthy or natural. And we didn't have chocolate bars on the savannah while we were evolving. And there is this phenomenon of downregulation that occurs if you present that kind of a supersized stimulus to the taste buds over and over again, your taste buds are no longer as sensitive and your whole pleasure system is no longer as sensitive to what nature has to offer. Um, so my point is that we're also trying to get high, get a little high with food. It's not just like you don't go to the dentist and they say, I can't numb you out with Novocaine because we're out on Novocaine. I, I think I'll inject you with chocolate instead. Right. right? Uh, it's because there's something else that chocolate is doing for, for us. There's something else that, um, you know, chips or pasta or pizza is doing for us than just numbing us out. So I think when you put all those three things together, um, it's very true that there's an underlying emotional conflict. Like I, I and I've had to work in that for my life. Why? Why do I get unhappy like that? Why do I get lonely? Why, you know, I've had to teach myself to socialize more. And, um, but by the same token, that can take years to really work your way through it, right? So I, I encourage that journey. I think it's an important part of the journey. But 
you can disempower some of those other pieces first. If you no longer accept the excuse of, well, I'm just comforting myself, and you say I'm getting high, it starts to become less, less likely that you're going to indulge with food. If you tell yourself that there's always this voice of justification that you can, um, that, that you can intervene with and, and look at the false logic in between the emotion and the action, then you can also make progress like that. So uh, what I found is that it's a multi-pronged approach and there are a lot of people who don't want to do the emotional work. Um, no, it's painful. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's very painful. And but but I mean, I think if you were to ask people, just a, a personal opinion, if you're asked people like, do you want to learn? Like, do you want some steps to you can actually start u- using to stop binge eating? I think 100 percent of people be like, absolutely. Write it down. Give me the plan. Give me the book. What give me the you know, give me this podcast, whatever it is. But then if you said, okay, well, do you also want to you want the steps you want to the tools to work through the emotional stuff? I think some of them, let me think about it. I'll get back to you on that one. Right now, I want to stop binge eating. Thank you so much for listening to the Strong by Design podcast. To help our show reach more listeners just like you, please let us know how we've changed your life by leaving a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Go to strongbydesignpodcast.com. That's strongbydesignpodcast.com. Let's get back to the show. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening right now shaking their heads and going, this is something I struggle with. I know I do it. I've bought the diet books. I've joined Weight Watchers. I've got the gym membership. I've done all those things that we tend to do, but yet I'm still binge eating. What, what can I do? What can I, you know, what can they start doing today to work towards getting control of that? Yeah. So you have to know when you're about to do it, if you want to intervene. Right. So, so you're going to have to take control and define what healthy eating means to you and what, what binge eating or, you know, bad eating means to you. And I believe that the best way to do that is starting with one simple rule. It could be something that you, something you could and would do that doesn't feel too onerous, but which would make a big difference. Some people will say, I'll just never go back for seconds. Other people will say, I'll always put my fork down between bites. Some people say, I'll only ever have chocolate on a weekend, or I'll only eat pretzels in a major league baseball park, or I'll, you know, I'll never consume calories after 8 p.m. So some simple rule that would make a big difference, but you know, it's not the ultimate diet. You're probably not going to lose all your weight this week doing this. You might not lose any weight at all. The, the idea is to just draw a very bright line so you know when you're about to cross it. Mm-hmm. And then you start listening for your inner reptilian brand. You can call it your food monster. You can call it your junkyard dog, um, your food demon, whatever you want to call it. But you listen for it to start trying to convince you to cross the line. And... When you hear it start starting to try to cross the line, you know that the reptilian brain is active because you came up with this rule through serious forethought and consideration. It's something you really wanted to do. And so now we're going to have to deactivate the reptilian brain and jump up into the, the neocortex. There are a couple of ways to do that. First of all, you take a breath. And if you can breathe in for uh, shorter than you breathe out, and we like to call these 7 breaths. So breathe in for a count of seven and breathe out for a count of 11. If you were being chased by a, a tiger, you wouldn't have time to do that. So you're signaling your body that this is a time of relaxation. You're, there's no emergency here. Um, this is time to rest and digest and really think about what's necessary. There's no emergency famine. There's no tiger chasing us. We can actually think this through. So take a couple of breaths, a couple of 7-Eleven breaths. I like people to carry around a paper and a pencil or a smartphone with them. And then I want them to ask their reptilian brain, okay, I have this rule. I said that I'm, you know, I'm never going to have chocolate during the week again. Why do you want me to have the chocolate even though it's a Wednesday? And I want you to write that down. What, what does your reptilian brain say is the reason you should have it? Write down all the reasons that it says you should do it. Oh, come on, you can just start tomorrow. 
or um, I'm wearing blue. I'm wearing blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or I didn't have enough for breakfast. I'm really hungry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and you see, the act of writing is an upper brain activity, also. Mm. Yes, right? I, writing. I think writing is a great tool in so many things. So, in so in I'm so glad many to areas. hear this here. So you write it down. Then you take another breath, another couple of Seven Eleven breaths. Then you look at what you wrote down and you say, how is my reptilian brain wrong? How is it lying to me? And it usually wins by providing a half truth with a bigger lie. Uh, so let's take the one we keep harping on. You're not going to gain any, any weight because you worked out hard enough. It's just as easy to start tomorrow. Well, it's probably true that if I had one chocolate bar after a really hard workout, I probably wouldn't gain weight. That's probably true. Um, is it easier to start tomorrow? Is it going to do any damage? No, it's not for the reasons that we talked about before. And it will also break my spirit. It will make me feel like I can't stick to a plan that I made. And so I'll write this down. I'll write down all the reasons that the, um, the reptilian brain is wrong. And we call that refuting. We call that refuting the uh, reptilian brain. Once I've really written that down, I should feel a little bit calmer. I should have, now I've breathed through it. I've deactivated the emergency response system. I've, I've shown the logic that was greasing the chute to be false. Now I want to ask myself, how will keeping the reptilian brain in a cage right now and doing the right thing, how will make that, that make me a happier, better person? Because you know the, the reptilian brain is going to be saying, you're going to feel so deprived. You really need this right now. How can you give this up? But how will it, what am I giving up if I actually indulge? And how will it make me a happier, better person? So for me, keeping my reptilian brain in a cage makes me feel like someone who walks the walk and doesn't just talk the talk. It makes me feel like I can uh, be in a relationship. It makes me feel like I can be present and empathic and able to communicate with people. It makes me feel like a leader. It makes me feel energetic and strong and like I'm um I really become a person who um who can control what they eat and I'm not going through the years of um feeling powerless and out of control like I did you know 20 years ago and so you put that all together you've you've deactivated the emergency response you've jumped back up into your neocortex where you really live you've you've um you've proven the logic that the reptilian brain was using to be false. And then you've linked the act of maintaining on your plan to the kind of person you're trying to become. It becomes a very powerful, um, you know, very powerful combination of steps that takes you out of that. And, and then once you're out of the emergency situation, once you're no longer in danger of binging, then you can say, well, was I feeling lonely? Should I have taken better care of myself? Should I reach out to someone? Should I call my therapist? Um, th then you can work on all the emotional stuff, which is equally as important. Right, but, right. Yeah. And I think it's important that you, like how you said that, that in the moment when that's happening, ask the question, what, what are all the lies you're being told or all the justifications? It's not in that moment that doing that deep, like, okay, what is this all about? What was I, because there's too much, there's too much, um, there's too many rough edges in that moment right now. Like you're, it's too like us, like we're super sensitive to it because anything could well, drive us to the chocolate or whatever. But I think it's really important that, um, you know, you're saying like, write it down or in your phone, like ask those questions and write down what all those responses are. And then when you get past that moment and you're on the other side of it, that's the time to look back and go, so what was that about? What was I feeling? Like, right. was I, you know, did I, did I see my ex with somebody else across the street? Did I, I don't know, like just what was the trigger? Because in the moment, it's a, you don't have the same clarity because we're not calm enough with, with the breathing and the, the writing and the asking the questions. Once we get to a call on the other side, we're, we're kind of in a better state of calm. And safer, yeah. Safe, yeah, safe. The clarity is like, oh, how about that? <laughs> how about that? You yes, know? exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Really good, really yeah. good. So I hope... I hope um, for all you listening, I hope you're, you know, listening and hearing that because my next question is, is it possible? Then is it possible? And again, this is not something that's like anything. Um, it's not going to just boom happen like that. Um, if, you know, we've been binging for a long time 
or even if we haven't been for a long time, if we just tend to binge at times, I mean, it's still something that I think people struggle, have struggled with for years. There's all kinds of, you know, help, help out there. Um, but it's still happening. Is it possible, because the title of your book is Never Binge Again, is it possible to never binge again? Yeah. Um, so if you look at the psychology of winners, let's look at an Olympic archer, for example. When an Olympic archer is aiming at the bullseye, they make themselves one with the bullseye before they let go of the arrow. They're not thinking, maybe I'm going to hit it and maybe I won't they see the arrow going into the bullseye before they let go. And they approach the pursuit of the goal with an attitude of perfectionism. They're not saying maybe I will, maybe I won't, so that they can purge their mind of doubt and insecurity, because that doubt and insecurity when you're in pursuit of a goal does nothing besides distract you from the goal. It, it drains your energy from the goal. It leaves you with a feeling of un uncertainty and unassuredness that prevents you from hitting the bullseye. It actually makes your performance worse. Now, if that archer misses the bullseye, and even the best Olympic archers miss it quite often, they analyze by how much did they miss it, in what direction, and what adjustments need to be made in order to hit it better next time. What they don't do is say, oh my god, I missed the bullseye, I'm pathetic, I might as well shoot the rest of the arrows up into the air. Right, um, And so what, what they're really doing, and, and this is the case for um, cyclists and mountain climbers, and if you look at the psychology of winning, there's this process of purging your mind of doubt and insecurity and becoming one with the goal. But then when you make a mistake, there's the process of forgiving yourself with dignity and saying, okay, at that point you say progress, not perfection. I'm human, I made a mistake, what do I do? Like if you touch a hot stove, at that point you don't say, oh my God, I'm a pathetic hot stove toucher, I might as well put my whole hand down on the stove. No, we, do, we don't accept that negative punitive voice going over and over again. We accept the pain for the moment, because if you don't know that you missed the balls, you don't, you don't know that you hit the hot stove, you can't make adjustments. And the correlate to that is there's a little bit of guilt and shame when you when you miss your goal, when you, when you don't hit the goal that you're making, but... Um, but you need to forgive yourself relatively quickly and understand that that voice of self-castigation, that negative voice that gets stuck in your head, is actually trying to make you feel too weak to resist the next mistake. So it doesn't really do you any good. It actually makes it more likely you're going to perform worse. So commit with perfection, but forgive yourself with dignity. What most people do is they will pursue a goal with an attitude of progress and not perfection. And you could say, well, what's, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that it allows for doubt and insecurity in the pursuit of the goal. You want to save the progress and not perfection for afterwards if you make a mistake and you're trying to get better. So on a practical basis, um, does anybody make a set of rules and stay like that forever without making mistakes? Absolutely not. Um, there, there's a learning process and um, people need to forgive themselves repeatedly and keep getting up and aiming at the target. But there's not a better way that I can find to aim at the target than to aim with perfection and say, I'll never binge again. I haven't had chocolate in about eight years. You know, oh, I, I, made, I made that rule a long time ago. I fell mad almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I tried six ways to send it to figure out a way I could do it. Right, right. Personally, yeah, and, yeah. and it just didn't work for me. No, and, well, I mean, that's, I mean, good. I mean, like, I'm like, wow, that's, I think just anybody listening that's struggling with binging, hearing that, I think if that doesn't give you hope, then I don't know what will. I mean, I, I don't have cravings anymore. It looks like a big bag of chemicals. And yeah. I, I you know, my, my program is diet agnostic, so most of my audience does eat chocolate. And there are abstainers, there are moderators, there are ways to accommodate all of that. Right. Um, but, but for me personally, I figured out that um, whatever rule I made that would have me trying to moderate chocolate, I would blow right through it. And um, after a couple of years of trying, I just decided not to have it at all. Yeah, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, awareness, you know, just huge awareness and knowing what's going to work and when something actually doesn't. And I think that's another thing is um, being able to just look at something and go, I've actually tried all the things that, you know, I didn't, I, when this one didn't work, I didn't just give up and say, well, I'm going to, you know, just stick with a bad habit or whatever. It's the acknowledgement that I did it, but, you know, ultimately this just is not, I probably just need to 
say goodbye to it because it is what it is. You know, and another important point, which what you just said made me think of, was that most people, when they're thinking about trying something new, have this voice in their head that says, you've tried and failed so many times. Why do you think this is any different? Beauty right? of self-sabotage. Ooh. Right. And that's called collecting evidence of failure, which yeah. leads you to have a failure identity. You want to collect evidence of success instead. Right. Um, so, for example, after a binge, you want to say, I had five cupcakes instead of 15. How come? How did I manage to do that? You mm -hmm. know, or I, I stopped after a half an hour instead of five hours. How did I do that? Right. Um, I was just saying something really important. Okay. So people tend to believe that negative voice that says you've tried and failed so many times before. It's not worth trying. They don't recognize that that's binge motivated. You know, the reptilian brain likes that voice because that means it's going to get fed more. It's going to get fed more junk. Um, but it also goes against the evidence because when you look at the difference between people who lose weight permanently, you know, for five years or more versus people who go up, go up and down, one of the biggest distinctions between them is the sheer number of attempts. Successful people have tried and failed more than unsuccessful people. And so when, the, when you are reptilian brain says you've tried and failed so many times that's evidence that you can't do this no it's actually evidence that you are more likely to be able to do it because like the george harrison song with every mistake we must surely be learning mm -hmm. right here comes yep. the sun with every mistake i yep. won't sing because I, <laughs> I i sing like a wounded moose in heat after it's been insulted by a passing warthog um <laughs> but but with every mistake we must surely be learning and every attempt makes it more likely that you'll succeed on the next one it's just how it's just how the brain works where we're organisms of trial and error learning and so you need to make it possible to keep getting up and trying again um, the name of the game is staying in the game until you win the game right well and, and that's really sound solid advice and, and i mean when i just think of other podcasts uh, i've done other books i've read it's you know there's an underlying theme in life like it needs to it really needs to be on a t-shirt it's that failing to success i mean some of the greatest most successful people of all time talk about that how they failed their way to success because they just never stopped until they you know there isn't if everything was a one size fits all we'd all be rich and beautiful and like we'd all have all of it all the time but it's just, it's not like that it doesn't work that way so i love that you know you you say that in this you know in this arena um because that same principle applies you fail your way to success absolutely you know and i think absolutely. it's i think it's a wonderful and i think it's i think it's a really i don't i don't mean forgiving and like oh you can forgive yourself but it's a very loving way to say to yourself well i'm I'm still going to try. I'm going to try something else. I'm going to try something new. I think it's a way to, to be gentle with yourself, be kind to yourself, because the minute we start doing that, well, I've failed so many times. What's the point? You know, we get into that victim role and it's a lovely backdoor self-sabotage. So then we really don't have to take accountability in the end anyways. And, you know, we just go on being miserable and, you know, not, not trying. So I think, you know, having that resilience um, is, is paramount. Tanya, the other reason that I call the book Never Binge Again is because we have to present our rules to our reptilian brain as if they're set in stone. The, the reptilian brain is like a, brain is like a two-year-old. And I, I remember when my niece was two years old. Her name is Sarah. She's adorable. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe she turned 17 a couple of days ago. Um, <laughs> but when she was two years old, I said, Sarah, you can't cross the street without holding my hand never ever 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 you can't ever cross the street without holding my hand mm -hmm. She's like okay good and the reason i said that even though i know i knew in five or six years you know my sister would be teaching her how to cross the street by herself right um i lied to her technically i lied to her because she wasn't mature enough to have images of crossing the street by herself come into her mind it was too dangerous and it's like that with the reptilian brain at, at the moment of impulse you lose your rational ability. You lose your ability to discern conditions and you know situations and to really remember all that was most important to you. And so you need something that's very primitive and uh, it's, it's like, this is the law. I will never have chocolate on a Saturday again, ever. I will never binge again, ever. I'll never break my rules again. 
the absence of saying that, if I call the book binge sometimes, <laughs> the, the, the pig, the inner reptilian yeah. brain would keep on saying, is it time? Is it time? How about now? Yeah. How about now? How about now? Like a kid in a toy store who doesn't yeah. know when they're going to get a puppy. You can have a puppy. You can have a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> and you say later, now can I have a puppy? Now can I have a puppy? Like, yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's, exactly. The concept of time is just poof. Do your kids have a puppy? They had two. But okay. we had, at the time, we had a huge farm, so we had all kinds of things. <laughs> But I, it was that you know when you, when you don't when you don't when it isn't set and so like clear clear borders very clear defined borders make it easy or make it workable for most people involved because if you give the well later if, when you give these very gray area um, non definitive responses or boundaries there's there's really there's no set place to stay within it's kind of, everything can be pushed or altered or changed or which also you know. means you have to make constant decisions yes so, so if you say i'm going to have chocolate ten percent of the time and not indulge ninety percent of the time that's a good idea in theory, mm. but every time you're in front of a chocolate bar, you have to make another decision and willpower is the ability to make good decisions. Uh, and so when you have a squishy rule like that, where it's not clear when mm. the 10% is, when the 90% yeah, yeah. is. Like, oh, this is 90%, or this is 10%, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. And then you then you have this debate in your head all the time, and that wears you down. Yes. So, so if you say, I'm only going to have chocolate on Saturdays, then all your decisions about chocolate are made during the week. You don't have to worry about it. Right. And, and it doesn't wear down your willpower constantly. So you don't need willpower to eat well. Right. Well, this has been um, so good. I want to have you back. Um, okay. I want to talk more about like binge eating, stress eating, all of this because I think it's I think it's such um, it, it's it's one of those topics that it doesn't matter the age, the gender. It's just it's human beings. It's human behavior, and it's something that a lot of us struggle with, or have struggled with, still struggling with. Um, and a lot of what you said, I think, is very applicable. So right now, what I want you to do is for our listening audience to tell them everywhere they can find you. Like they can find your books on Amazon, but I know you also have a YouTube channel. I watch some of your YouTube videos, so you have lots of great free content available to people. I do. So what are all of the social media platforms and places that people can, after the show, go find you? You know, the best thing to do is go to neverbingeagain.com. The best thing to do is go to neverbingeagain.com okay. and click the big red button. Okay. That'll take you to the reader bonus page. If you sign up for that, you'll get three things. You'll get a copy of the Kindle Nook or PDF book for free. Nice. Um, it, we do have it available on Audible and in, um, in paperback, but there's a charge for that. But it's free on digital formats. Okay. You will get a set of recordings that are essentially me taking people through full-length coaching sessions. Mm. The reason for that is that this sounds very abstract and weird um, in theory. You must be thinking, why does Tanya have this doctor around who's got a pig inside of him? And <laughs> like, what, what, what's going on here? Um, isn't that you know cruel? But you know, it's a very compassionate process. And you'll see that we take people from a sense of despair and hopelessness and, and terror about food to feeling mm. confident and secure and enthusiastic very quickly. Um, so I want you to hear that. Okay. And this is all free. And the third thing you'll get is a set of food plan starter templates. So nice. whatever dietary philosophy you have, if it's keto or whole foods or high carb or low carb or point counting or calorie counting, that's all there. Neverbingeagain.com. Click the big red button. And then you'll find our YouTube channel and Instagram and coach, coaching programs and all that. Well, that makes yeah. it really nice and easy. Neverbingeagain.com. Mm -hmm. Click the big red button. It's that simple, folks. It's that, it's that simple. Yeah. <laughs> well, Glenn, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, I really enjoy the conversation. And like I said, I do. I would like to have you back in a couple of months so we can talk more about binge eating sure. and stress eating and all of this and what people can be doing and um, just keep getting the information out there to help people. S I, I really send me an email. I'll be happy to come back anytime. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, again, I am Coach Tanya here on Strong by Design, talking with Dr. Glenn Livingston today. Please uh, don't forget to rate our show and leave us a review and you know share the podcast episode with somebody that you think could really benefit from the information. Take care, everybody. Be healthy, be happy, and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much for listening to the Strong by Design podcast. If you found value in today's episode, Please subscribe so that more people can find out about our show. Plus, you don't want to miss any future episodes with the amazing guests and topics we have lined up for you.